Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you, Jeremy, for inviting me. Uh, and uh, welcome to all my fellow alums. Thanks for spending time with us this evening. I'm often asked just what exactly does a curator do? A curator is a keeper or a caretaker of a collection, managing record keeping, research databases, the proper storage and preservation of collections, even tracking the market uh, to follow trends related to their collections. And of course, curators are the interpreters of the collections for which they care. Curators of art are most often associated with museums and are almost always specialists. My specialty is uh, late 19th century American expatriate artists and in particular, Gary Melchers. Belmont is the last resident of the American painter Gary Melchers and as curator of the home and studio, I have at my disposal the largest collection of Melchers works anywhere, including um, dozens of preliminary sketches and studies that give me intimate knowledge of the artist's creative storehouse and his methodology. Okay, Mark, and I have the first slide. Another question I'm frequently asked, if given the choice, what picture would you have as your own? Um, that's kind of a tough choice. Out of 1,650 items, uh, I would have to choose the china closet, the, the, uh, the painting that appears on your screen, painted by Melchers around 1908. In terms of both uh, uh, technical mastery and commercial value, it's a premier Melchers. Uh, the, the painting's rich chromatic effects and the decorative play of light make this painting consistent with contemporary French Impressionism. And Impressionism continues to be, to, to demand strong prices in the market. So that makes this painting one of our most valuable in the collection. The China Closet is set in the home of Melcher's American colleague, George Hitchcock, and pictures Hitchcock's wife with uh, working with her maid, Kiri, to set a table for tea. Um, while we know that Henrietta Hitchcock was a strikingly handsome woman, Melchers painted her on at least two or three other occasions, here he has her back to us. The real focal point is the demure maid, Kiri, who is uh, presented as decorative an object as the glittering china she balances on her tray. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hmm. <laughs> there we go, thank you. Oddly enough, for such an important painting, there are no preliminary sketches or studies to document the evolution of this painting, but photographs that the artist used to uh, as visual aids in the painting of the picture do survive. And here are two on your screen. And if I also may uh, show you, the, this is a stack of about 100 other photos, most of them taken by Gary Melcher's um, to use as visual aids. And they're all housed in polyester sleeves because they're in distribution. And we keep our collection storage area at a low humidity because of the fugitive medium that's suspended on the paper, photography paper. So it's supporting artifacts that are like these that make our collection so important to the study of Gary Melchers. Now the differences between the two photos reveal that all along, it was the maid's image that was critical to Melcher's vision. From the two options he gave himself, he chose to follow more closely the image uh, on the far right. To enhance Curie's fresh and, and pretty appeal, Melcher's painted her with hair highlighted in gold, 
and outfitted her in an eye-catching lavender dress rather than the customary black livery that we see in the photo in the middle. And now for some of my other favorites. Next slide, please. Hmm. We'll need to, to fix this. I, I don't see any slide. That's the next slide, number three. Um, I guess we can't do any better than that. Uh, Gary and Curran Melchers were themselves bitten by the art collecting bug, acquiring everything from Japanese woodblock prints to Flemish still life paintings and portraiture. Um, next slide is number four, if you could select that. We cannot make it any larger. Thank you, beautiful. One of my personal favorites out of Melcher's acquisitions is the charming double portrait of a lady and a young boy. They come to us from a bygone era. The boy is pictured in really tiny pointed shoes or slippers, and it's probably in his first pair of trousers, although they're still fitted in the back with a drop seat for easy access. Uh, the mature lady very likely is his grandmother and she appears in a fashionable empire gown and mob cap. Next slide, please. Let's see what happens. Yay! Thank you, Mark. It's a mystery how this painting came into the, the uh, possession of Gary and Corinne Melcher. Uh, was it inherited through family? Was it purchased from a dealer or an auction house? We'll probably never know. And we don't know who the identity what the identity of the subjects is, nor do we know who the painter was that painted the picture. If you look at the rear of the chair seat in the far right of the painting, and I've zoomed in for a detail on the right side of your screen, all we can make out is an R uh, followed by maybe a V or a K, or it might even be a date. It, even after conservation, it's very hard to read. In any case, it's very likely an American or French production and dates sometime between 1800 and 1810 based on the classicizing style of the costumes and the French directoire furnishings. No, I won't, I won't advance yet. The painting is a classic example of a portrait type called the conversation piece. Conversation pieces are usually small in scale, ours is uh, roughly 20 by 16. And conversation pieces typically reproduce uh, images, uh, informal uh, family uh, settings or a circle of friends uh, appearing within uh, an interior, an intimate interior, and the intention of which is to reproduce likenesses and to commend the, um, the, the virtues and the comfort of domestic life. Hundreds were painted in the 18th century, and many of the figures in these paintings were stock types, although I hope our pair isn't a stock type um, because I've come to regard them with great curiosity and affection. If they did once live, just exactly what can we find out about them? Grandmama is certainly genteel uh, and uh, handsome. She's also house proud, purposely planting herself in a handsome, well-appointed room uh, and expensive drapes, carpet, wallpaper enhance the beauty of the room. And she has other lovely things within her reach like the glass dome clock on a nearby cabinet at the far margin, right margin of the painting. By the way, clocks were a common feature in conversation pieces as emblems of time. Clocks were the regulators of domestic life. And uh, despite all the trappings, the lady's uh, most uh, treasured earthly possession must be this little boy with whom uh, she speaks. And the cunning little boy directs our gaze 
to a book, uh, which she balances on her knees, and I don't know what that book could be. It makes us curious, is it a, a family Bible with the lineage, or is it something that a book, maybe a biography on the family? We don't know. Next slide, please. The lady and her little boy are viewing engravings of celebrated land and cityscapes. Uh, on the table nearby, we see that they're viewing them with the aid of a perspective glass or vodoptique, also called a zogroscope, which you see in the detail on the right. A perspective glass is an optical device comprised of a, a convex uh, magnifying lens and an angled mirror used to enlarge and to heighten the illusion of three dimensionality when you're viewing prints. Next slide, please. Curiously, Gary and Corinne Melchers collected a couple dozen of these same kind of engraved views, some of which they displayed on the staircase in their house uh, where they continue to hang today, although we've rotated out another set of uh, engraved prints. And I, I just wonder, it's possible that they acquired the portrait of the old lady and the boy because they were already interested in collecting the engraved prints, or did they collect the engraved prints because it was suggested by this portrait that came into their possession? We won't know that, I'm sure, ever. Next slide, please. This is an example of a perspective print. It pictures, I'm sure many of you recognize it, the cathedral, bell tower, and baptistry in the Piazza del Duomo in Florence, Italy. Engraved prints like these were really popular with late 18th and 19th century tourists, enabling tourists to bring them home uh, as picture postcards, so to speak, to illustrate their favorite European palaces and gardens and, and church squares, even the interior of famous theater houses and concert halls like we saw on the staircase at Belmont. These were a form of novelty and entertainment that could be enhanced by perforating, in this case, many of the windows and affixing colored tissues to the back to enliven the prints when you set them in front of a window or a candle. Undoubtedly, a listening the same oohs and ahs that we get from our visitors today. Unfortunately, I couldn't photograph the print backlit, so you'll just have to come to Belmont to take a look at an illuminated example. Uh, let's see here. I will try to bring this up close to you because you'll see a slide of it in a minute. This is another item in our collection that I particularly admire, and it's so small, and I just wanted you to get a sense of its size. It is a diminutive plaster relief bust of a young woman mounted in an oval frame and a ribbon wrapped mat. She's made of plaster of Paris and was cast from the mold taken directly from an original sculpted in clay. Now, um, if we could have the next slide, Mark. There we go, there she is. And next to her, um, I have a medallion. Intaglios and commemorative medallions were very common, such as the one you see to the right, based on the Italian Renaissance, which um, took its precedent from, from ancient Roman examples. They typically picture bust length portraits in very shallow relief and in strict profile. This one pictures Gary Melcher's father, the sculptor, Julius Melcher's. But our little lass in the empire gown and bonnet is reproduced in a form which we see much less often in three quarter profile in very deep relief, giving her more of the spark of life than we see in uh, the example to the right. Unfortunately, we don't know who she is either, but it's worth noting that Mrs. Melcher's came from an, uh, it was a descendant of old Baltimore and Savannah families and it inherited several family uh, likenesses painted in miniature and dating to this period. It's entirely possible that this uh, relief, ceramic relief bust is yet another family heirloom. And I've read so many letters 
in archives exchange between Mrs. Melcher's ancestors. And I have to wonder if this is uh, the young woman who suddenly died of typhoid fever uh, around age 12 or 13. It was a sad letter and I'll never forget it. So it keeps me wondering. If you ask me what really excites me about being a curator, it would have to be the fun detective work. There are still so many questions that are unanswered about Melcher's body of work, like the challenge to, to locate lost paintings and separating the real Gary Melchers from copies or outright forgeries. And here's an example, Mark, if you could put me on the screen so that our viewers can take a better look at an example. Uh, this is a painting. Oh, <laughs> this is gonna be a challenge, I have a feeling. Melchers is known to have painted two or three riverscapes uh, in his career. Somebody else was aware of that and had a taste for painting riverscapes and painted uh, five or six more of fixing a fraudulent uh, signature, the Gary Melcher signature at the bottom of them. Uh, fortunately, every time they come up uh, at market, I recognize right away that they're not bona fide Melcher's paintings. A lot of innocent art collectors without my expertise don't realize that. And that's how I came to have uh, this painting here. Uh, somebody bought it and, and left it with me when they found out it wasn't authentic. Uh, another challenge, back to my, my slide uh, PowerPoint, Mark, please. Another challenge, uh, and next slide, please, is to sort out and identify some of Melcher's favorite models. Uh, it's a matching game that has been by, uh, led by some of our good friends in Holland, Ron van Floten, and most recently, Carla Kager. Um, there are lots of Ekmanders who posed for Gary and their families remember and have photographs of their family members and can say without doubt, you know, my aunt or my grandmother posed for this painting. And this is an example of one of Melcher's models. Her name was Hertje Zwart. And uh, it is believed that she posed for the girl with a hat on the left, which is now in the conservation lab, the photographs on the right were provided by Gerritsch's uh, family. And, and I think it's pretty convincing evidence myself. Next slide, please. We also see that Melcher's maid, Anna Decker, and that's a photo of Anna Decker to the right, posed as the mother in the Art Institute of Chicago's famed mother and child painting. Next slide, please. My happiest sleuthing exercise occurred over this little watercolor. And it's also seen um, over my right shoulder. Again, I want you to see it's a, a fairly small uh, watercolor painting. When I first saw it, it had all the indications of being a Melcher's, a very early one, which I was dating between 1884 and 1888. It was sent to me by a Dutch collector who had just purchased it online. And he informed me that the dealer who sold it to him couldn't make out the signature. But this collector who knew a lot about Melcher said, I think it, it, it reads as Melcher's. He had the painting sent to me without ever seeing it himself first and uh, to send it to me to get my opinion. I was almost certain it was a Melcher's. And the setting is even the studio which Melcher shared in Holland with his American colleague, George Hitchcock. But I needed proof. After all, this also could have been painted by George Hitchcock. Gary and Corinne in the early days, excuse me, Gary and George in the early days would often sit down together to paint the same subject. And uh, their watercolor styles were nearly indistinguishable in these early years. But the glaring concern for me was the signature. The, um, the, it's not right. Gary Melchers did not sign his name in cursive until much, much later in his career. And it's not even spelled correctly. It says Melchers, it's missing the R. 
milches instead of melchers. So I spent the summer searching for related sketches and studies to support my theory that it was a melchers. I found a cryptic mention in some old records here at Thelma that Melchers had submitted a watercolor to a watercolor show in New York City in 1885. And I thought, hmm, that's early enough. But I didn't have a title. I fortunately got my hands on a magazine, Art Amateur, 1885, in which appeared a review about this watercolor show. And I thought, what are the chances of uh, finding in this review mention of Melchers or even better, a description of my mystery painting? So the chances weren't very good, but breathlessly reading through the article, I came upon this quote. We point in illustration to a Dutch bachelor's breakfast. Aha by J.G. Melchers, and in the early years, he did sign his works J.G. He is Julius Garibaldi Melchers, after all. Uh, and it goes on, an exceedingly clever Hollander. He was often mistaken for a Dutchman. Notice how masterly was the way in which watercolor is made to do service in giving light to the teacup the bachelor holds in his hand. What substance there is in the figure of the picturesquely attired servant, who is doing the offices of the breakfast table. So there you are, Melchers it is. And of course, I've concluded that the, the signature is not Melchers hand, but was spuriously added by someone else, maybe the first owner or a later uh, owner who knew the value of a signed picture over an unsigned one. And so just inserted a signature signature for Gary in absentia. I was thrilled to be able to, to introduce a new uh, painting to Melcher's body of work. And the owner was so pleased for me that he gifted the painting to the museum outright. And on that happy note, I turn the program over to my colleague, Jared Kearney. Right, let's see if this, see if that's working there. All right. Well, thank you so much, Joe. That was awesome. That was really, really cool. Um, let me get to make sure the camera's working and all the angles and all that stuff there. All right. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. That's, uh, that's really, really awesome of you. Um, I want to start off by asking you folks at home to take a moment and look around yourself and look at the objects that surround you, okay? Look at the objects that surround you in your home. And I want you to imagine that it's suddenly fast forwarded 200 years, okay? You're suddenly 200 years in the future. What would those objects in your home say about you? It would say quite a bit, I would think, right? Um, and that's the magic of artifacts. That's the magic of them. They're not just old things that, that exists only in our memory. They're, they're phrases, they're human phrases manifest. And that's what we have here, they're right here. Um, and so I'm gonna show you some of the artifacts that we have here for James Monroe. And they tell a story, okay? They tell a story not just about James Monroe, but they tell a story about the early American Republic and the emerging American identity. What am I talking about? Well, let me show you. All right, um, I'm gonna start off with something small, okay? Something really small. And I'll pull this up here for you. This is James Monroe's writing set, okay? Let me uh, get my glasses on here. I'm getting old. All right, get my glasses there. Okay, so this is James Monroe's writing set, okay? And, you know, writing instruments of the late 18th century, they included quill pens, metal nib pens, graphite pens, well, these have both, right? This has a quill pen and it has a metal pen, okay? And you know how they make the quill pen is, you know, they would take strong flight feathers, right? And they would cut an angle and then they would cut a slit on the end. And the favored uh, writing style of the time was called round hand. And that, and that, necess that necessitated 
a, uh, a really fine point. So you had to constantly sharpen the ends of your, of, your, of your quill pen. You had to constantly sharpen it. And that's where you get the pen knives from, okay? <laughs> so it's kind of a cool little relation there. Um, and then, as you know, the point to this end, you know, quill pens, um, you know, graphite pencils, although they're available in the late 19th century, they were often little more than sticks. And actually, I'll talk a little bit more later on about that. Well, what's cool about this is that this, if you, if you notice letters written in more towards the revolutionary time period, and then letters written more in the early 19th century, and then kind of going on, the writing style in the earlier days were a little bit more, you know, fluid, a little bit more open, a little bit more, uh, you know, round hand as it were. But as time went on with the quill pen, as the metal nib pens came into vogue, the uh, the writing starts to get you know a little bit more concise, not quite as flowy. And you can see it if you look at the letters from back in the day. Um, you can see the transition, and that's what's really cool about this tiny little object is that not only uh, is did it belong to James Monroe, and it represents his and it represents his his writing and his which I'll talk about in just a second, but it represents that transition between the old world and you know the old world and the night and the, and the emerging American Republic. It represents that transition because it has both. Not only that, but for James Monroe personally. He would have had something like this as he traveled around the district courts uh, when he was in his early lawyer days. So it's kind of cool. You have sort of the best of both worlds in this tiny little object. And sort of on a side note, um, I actually I looked up, you know, people ask me about ink and what's the ink that goes into. Well, ink was actually a fairly complex <laughs> recipe. And I looked it up. And here I'll read you this. Um, let's see. A, a recipe for ink was... Arabic, three ounces vitriol, two ounces gulls, three ounces white wine, eh? two pints and a half, beat the gulls, put them in the wine with an earthen vessel, set it in the sun for six days, stir them every day, twice or thrice, and sit it over a modern fire for half a day or a day. And then it let it strain and dissolve some vitriol and gum. So there you have it. It was a very complex process. And um, that's what I love about this. This, this tiny little artifact that it has sort of a, a representation of these different worlds. Okay, so let me move on here. Something else is a little bit small, but something that I love. I love this object. Now hold this up. Here's a glove that belonged to James Monroe. Okay, let me hold this up here for you. And this is a, <laughs> it's constructed of doe skin, and this this a tan colored glove that belonged to James Monroe. And although the the leather's thin, you know, it's finely crafted. The simple construction of the gloves makes it difficult to determine the date of fabrication, but it's likely, you know, those 1780s, somewhere around there. And it was likely worn a tandem with the suit that I'll show you in just a second. It's kind of cool over here. Um, so, so what? You know, what's the big deal? With this? Well, first of all, if you look at this, if you look at this glove, what's kind of cool about it is that it looks like something that you can just buy at Walmart, right? I mean, it looks like a modern glove. It looks like, it doesn't look like anything that's, you know, ancient or historical or anything. It just looks like a modern glove. And I love the fact that some things in history, they, they change drastically and some things remain exactly the same. And this is kind of an example because this is sort of the same look. But the other thing is that, you know, America in those days, they were slow to embrace industry, right? Um, you know, they, 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 they were a little bit slower to embrace industry. So they didn't have this massive tanning industry like they had over in England or something like that. But what did we have? We had a lot of natural resources and for tanning and for gloves, what did that mean? Well, what do we have a lot of to this very day? What do we have a lot of? America has a lot of deer, right? And that's what this is. <laughs> so this is made out of doe skin. Um, so it's kind of cool because you have, uh, you have the story of like the sort of simplicity of design back in the day, but also it sort of represents how America embraced its natural resources. We went with what we had and that was doe skin. Um, okay, so let me move on. All right, so this is pretty cool. Um, I'm going to move the camera over a little bit so you can see. Let me just adjust this just a tad so you can see this fella. Okay, now let's see. I can get it over here. So this is the vest and breeches. Let me get it a little bit closer. You can see it. There we go. All right. All right, so the vest and beaches, right? It's wool flannel, 
and it's decorated with sequins. And you know, it, it, it dates approximately to uh, 1786, around that time period, the time period when James Monroe lived in Fredericksburg. And something that's interesting about it is it's, 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 it's sort of middle of the road. It's, it's, it's fancy enough, but it's not overly done. And what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about these sequins here. And let me show you something. I'm gonna pull up a picture. I'm gonna show you something here. It's hard to see them, but these little sequins, if I do a share of a photo, let me find this here. And I'll pull this up. Okay, here is a close up. Can you guys see that? We can indeed. Here's a all right, very good. So here's a close up of a fiber wrapped gold thread. What am I talking about? Fiber wrapped gold thread. Well, what I'm saying is that the tiny sequences on there, the little flax on there, was actually delicately wrapped with this gold thread. I took my little nerd magnifying glass and I, and I zoomed it in. And so it has this gold thread wrapped, wrapped around it. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that it, it, it would have slightly glittered in the candlelight, in the sunlight. It would have slightly glittered, but it wouldn't have been crazy overdone. And that was very representative of James Monroe. Let me pop this up. Um, he was, his aesthetic was very, uh, I, I'm enough to be in the room, but I'm not going to overdo it. I'm not going to be over fancy, um, sort of a, a humble dignity, I guess you would. And so this is sort of representative of that. Um, you know, it's wool flannel. Um, it's not bad, but it's, it, but it does have this gold sequence on it, but it's not overdone. It's not something that's going to be crazy and, and in your face or anything like that. And so that sort of tells a little bit of story about that James Monroe's aesthetic and, and what he was, what part of what he was all about. Um, okay, so let's fast forward a little bit. Let's fast forward. Let me see if I can find this here. I'm gonna show you something else. Let's fast forward to this. And I'm gonna pull up another photo here. And I'll pull this up. Okay, let's see this fella. All right. So this is James Monroe's court suit, okay? It was made of silk velvet. Uh, decorated with cut steel buttons. The suit belonged to James Monroe and it was worn during his second diplomatic uh, diplomatic mission of France. Okay, so Monroe's suit or, or his um, habit le français, as they say, was less ornate than the typical French court suits of the time, but it was still within acceptable standards for the French upper class. And the suit would have been appropriate for the court of Napoleon which James Monroe attended. Okay, so if you look at that, all right. So, so what? What does that mean? Well, again, we're looking at a suit, and I'll pull up the actual one here. So we're looking at a suit that was enough to be in the room, and it was enough to be there, but it wasn't like, it, it, it was unique. It, it was for him in particular. And it was also sort of, in a way, represented that, that American aesthetic that we belong on the table with Europe. We belong with you, but we're not one of you, okay? We're different. We're, we're, we're creating our own identity. And in my opinion, that this suit very much represents that. And let me pull this up here. I'll actually show you the real thing. It's a big fella. Let me see if I can get it up. Okay. There we go. There it is. It's very goth, right? <laughs> it would fit in very time. Uh, look at this. It's a it's a silk velvet, uh, which is actually very very extraordinary. Um, and something that I want to talk about in just a second. These cut steel buttons fascinate me. If you look at these buttons right right here. They're not made out of rhinestone, okay? They're made out of cut steel. And what am I talking about? Let me show you. Um, let me pull up another picture here. <laughs> this is really cool. All right, let me see. Let's see here. Get the share. Oh. Sorry about that. I'll get it in here in just a second. And okay, here's a close up. You see that? There it is. That's a close-up of the faceted rivets that's on this particular suit. And the, it, what's interesting about that is that you know it wasn't jewels, okay? It was steel cut, and that was actually part of the of the Napoleonic um, era. Is that uh, cut steel buttons, which are during the cut, they were actually sort of in vogue and they were popular in Europe during the time. So they would have had, they would have meant for James Monroe to fit in. And the way that they do these is they actually the, the craftsman has a base plate and then he facets the rivets on there and then cuts if you could look at it he cuts individual rivets 
our, our facets on the rivets in order to create that sort of diamond reflection effect. So it gives the effect of a, of a jewel of a diamond, but it not actually is a jewel or a diamond, which is pretty cool. All right. Um, now let's talk for a second about Mrs. Monroe. Okay, I wanna show you this. I'm gonna pull this up for a second. All right, so this is a, a Macer that belonged to Elizabeth Monroe, okay? See that? So the Macer, or e as they would say, um, it's in a cartouche shape, and let me open it up. It's sort of like the the uh, Swiss Army knife for ladies of 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 the of the upper class. And what's cool about this is not just what is not just the 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 Nasser, but what's in it. Um, what do we have here? Let me show you. We have a spoon. <laughs> Look at, can you see that? We have a spoon for the Nasser. We have an extension. For a knife and fork, here's an extension, and then I'll show you the knife and fork. Here's the fork right there. <laughs> and where's the knife? Jeremy, pull this up. And then the knife that they can put on a little extension for it. Here's the knife. All right. And then what it starts getting, and here's where it starts getting fascinating. So, what's this? Okay. That is an ivory slab that was used for note taking. And how would they do it? Well, they would do it with the little graphite pencils, the, what I was talking about earlier. So little tiny graphite pencils, they would write notes on here. In fact, that's kind of a, a good curator tip for you. If you uh, ever buy a, um, a old ivory memo pad, look very carefully. A lot of times you could still see the notes that were written on there in graphite. Um, and then I love this. Where is it? What is this? <laughs> This is, in fact, if I can get it to focus, this is, in fact, an ear scoop. And I'm not making that up. It's an ear scoop. And they would use it to clean out their ears. And I looked it up, and people did injure themselves. That's right. So people actually injured themselves doing this. But there it is. It's a brass ear scoop for your viewing pleasure. Now, something else that's kind of cool about this, and Joanna was, was talking about sort of the cool detective work that curators can do. Um, and in this case, uh, something that we didn't know is that they make this style in both England and they make it both in France. And uh, so we didn't know it, if it was English or France because there's no marks on it or anything like that. But when I looked closely at the measuring, there's actually a measuring stick on here, believe it or not. Look at that. Pretty cool. We got a measuring stick on here. When I looked closely at it, it was, in fact, the metric system, which means that it could only be what? French, right? It couldn't be, English wouldn't have used that back in the day. So there you have it, a Nasser belonging to Elizabeth Monroe. It has all kinds of cool stuff on it. Okay. Now, when I was showing you that course, too, and what, let me show you this. What I was talking about was the era in which uh, James Monroe was in his diplomatic mission to France in the, the early 1800s. Let me show you this fellow right here, okay? There it is, yes. This is James Monroe's court sword. And this is not a rapier. A lot of people think this is a rapier, but it actually isn't. This actually is, they call it a small sword. And it was sort of the, um, the descendant of the rapier, sort of the next generation of the rapier. So again, you have that transition from the older, the older world, uh, the, the older uh, um, 1700s into the 1800s, this, this transition time. Um, if you look at it carefully, it's a cut steel, right? It's got that steel uh, ha handle, steel pommel. Um, it would have been 1060 steel going on here, and they would have forged it in the tang, would have gone all the way to the end, okay? And so what? Well, if you remember that court suit that I showed you earlier, it kind of matches. You know, we don't know for sure if he wore this with this, that court suit, but it certainly has a similarity, does it not? Um, and it also has that aesthetic of it's not overly done. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you see a lot of court swords of back in the day and they're really ornate. Um, you, you know, you think of the, uh, uh, <laughs> you think of the rapier in, in um, Princess Bride, you know, the, the jewel encrusted uh, hand on everything. Well, that's not this, right? This is more reserved, it's more there, but it's, it's nice, it's good. And it's good enough to be in the room. And the other thing about it, which is interesting and reflective and tells the story of that time period, is that this steel, is very much useful, okay? 
It's got a point on there. So this could very much be used. So in many ways, the sword was a symbol of sort of like a Rolex, okay? Like where, where gentlemen would wear this on their side and you know, kind of show off their, 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 their status a little bit. But as a, 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 a public figure, back in those days, it wasn't completely out of the realm of possibility that James Monroe might get into a fight <laughs> into a until into a, a a battle uh and you know it, it 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 was not very often but it was possible it did happen um and so there you go they want to have something that is both reflective of who they are but also could in fact be used if they had to okay and i hope i have enough time here i'm going to show you something else all right Around the same time period, James Monroe bought this set of dessertware. Okay, so he bought a set of dessertware, um, and it's silver, and it's George the Third. Okay, and let me see if I can put it up a little bit closer if I can. All right, uh, it was it was made by Samuel Pemberton in 1805. Okay, and it was uh, in in England. And what's cool about this is I'm going to show you something, okay? So just remember this, but also I'm going to pull up a picture. Let me show you this picture. Oh, come on. There we go. Oh, all right. All right. Can you see that? All right. That are the maker marks on every single piece that is in that in, in that knife flatware collection, every single piece. Okay, what does it say on there? You got the Birmingham, 1805 mark. You got the Birmingham uh, uh, town mark. You got the English duty mark. You got the English sterling silver mark. Sterling silver means it's 92.5% silver. And you finally, you have Samuel Pendleton's maker's mark. So you have five different marks on every single one of these, of these pieces, along with Monroe's Griffin symbol here, the Monroe crest, the the, the the symbol there. So you have every single you have five on every single one. And what does that say? Well, it tells us you know people think that bureaucracy is a modern thing, that bureaucracy is something new. No, bureaucracy existed for centuries, and they they did it just as bad then as they do it now. And as the great Dr. McCoy said, the one constant in the universe is the bureaucratic mentality. Well, it's at, Dr. McCoy is absolutely right. They did it the same back then as they do now. So <laughs> anyway, all right. So uh, I'm watching my time here. Let me show you this fellow right here. Okay. So this is a walking cane. This is the head, or excuse me, this is the head of a walking cane. You got an eagle. And I'm going to pull up a close up of this. Okay. See if you can see this. Hopefully, I'm getting a little better at these. All right. There we go. Okay. So there's a close. There's, there it is. There's a the walking cane. And if you look at the incredible detail on that, I mean, the, 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 the craftsman really took his time and he really did his thing. But there's a couple of things that I want to talk about with this. One is the American Eagle symbol. OK, um, that's a whole wonderful story, which I don't have time for now. But basically, the, the short of it is that, you know, more and more folks in public office and just in general, were adopting the American Eagle symbol into their everyday materials. And you can see that a lot in the artifacts. OK, um, and then also I want to show you and I don't think you can really see it. Well, I guess you can see a little, the picture on here. Oh, no, you can't. Let me, let me show you this. OK, I'll show you on this side. There's acorns on there. There's actually acorns, and what's kind of cool about that is uh, the acorns. I, I, in my opinion, they look like swamp oak acorns, which <laughs> is kind of interesting if you think about uh, 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 Washington D.C. Uh, you know, built on the swamp, as they say. So uh, that's kind of an interesting sort of little detail. But the other thing that I wanted to, sorry, if you can sort of. Um, Imagine for just a second, I'll tell you a quick story. If you can imagine just a second, something about walking canes and, and gentlemen would be using walking canes, again, as a symbol of status, but also just something you know to sort of have and possibly as a weapon, although not too often, but it did in fact happen. 
And on that note, I want you to imagine, okay, that you're a fly on the wall in this situation. And, you know, you're, you're, you're in, you're in the, you know, uh, President when Monroe was president, you're in his, his office, okay? And <laughs> in walks uh, the Secretary of Treasury, uh, William H. Crawford, and who visits Monroe, and he asks him about government appointees for some of his friends, okay? Um, William, uh, William Crawford and James Monroe didn't really get along too well, and uh, the president was, you know, maybe, you know, sort of dilly-dallying on, on, uh, on getting his friend's appointments. And so uh, when, uh, when William Crawford asked the president about his friend's appointments, he sort of said, well, I haven't quite get it, you know, got to that to him. And, uh, you know, William Crawford did not take that too well. And he, he actually, uh, you know, he actually, he kind of was in a surly tone. And so President Monroe, you know, admonished him. And then Crawford, he came at him in a threatening manner um, with his cane. And so you can imagine you're fly on the wall of the office. You see like sort of these two old guys, you know, well, they're not old, but you know, they're older gentlemen. And, you know, William Crawford's coming at James, he has a cane and he's coming at James Monroe and he's like, you know, with his cane and he calls him an infertile scoundrel. Ooh, yeah, that's not great. And so, but Monroe, you have to remember Monroe, he was a six foot war veteran, okay? He literally had a bullet in his shoulder from the Battle of Trenton that he carried with him his whole life. He was no, he was no, uh, you know, small guy with with no experience. So, you know, and he was in still relatively decent shape, you know, especially for uh, someone that age. And he gets up and he immediately, he goes over to the fireplace and he takes a pair of fireplace tongs and he pulls them out and he he waves them around and he admonishes, you know, Crawford and, he, and, and, and in his defense. So you can see, <laughs> you can see this situation where William Crawford with his cane and James Monroe with his fireplace tongs facing off, you know, it reminds me of that scene in Grumpy Old Men with the two, where they start fighting with fishing, you know, fishing poles. <laughs> so they're going to, well, luckily it sort of simmered down in Crawford. He eventually apologizes and uh, uh, President Monroe, who's actually a very gracious guy, um, accepts his apology. So anyway, I just wanted to show you this cane head and just show you a little story. One of the stories of James Monroe. All right, hopefully I have time. I think I have time for maybe one more item, I think. Um, let me show you this, okay? And I wanna show you this. This is a whale oil lamp, okay? And you think to yourself, so what? You know, what what's the big deal about a, a, a whale oil lamp? Well, I'll tell you, um, there's some cool things about this. One is it's very representative of that time, okay, whale oil. Um, the whale oil industry was kicking in uh, during uh, James Monroe's public life, you know, especially, you know, in the early and then going on into the mid 1900s, or excuse me, excuse me, 1800s, going into the mid 1800s. And there's a couple of things that sort of distinguish the whale oil lamp. One is they have a metal stem that runs down into it because the whale oil was a little bit more uh, thicker and so to have a metal nib go down into the reservoir would help keep the, uh, the liquid a little bit more warm so that it could more fluidly go up into the wick. So that's something that distinguishes it. You also, in these early ones, you don't see a lot of the glass, uh, glass globes that are around them to protect, you don't see a lot of those. Um, and then also they have this more bulbous reservoir right here. And then another thing that this one does not have actually is a lot of times you'll have two wicks going down into it. And so what's kind of interesting about this though, is that it's, you know, this is something that, that you know, it was, it would have been, it dates to the period of around James Monroe's presidency. So it's something he might've had and could have had in the, in the White House, but it's not overly ornate, is it? It's not crazy engraved, it's not overdone. Um, it's sort of just, just middle of the road. It's just sort of, uh, you know, a nice lamp. Um, and I think again, that's sort of representative of James Monroe's uh, if James Monroe's uh, aesthetic and his policy. And you know, you, you got sort of three kind of major things that come out of whale oil at the time. You had, uh, you know, the, the whale oil itself could be used for lamps and things like that. And then you have uh, oil that was derived, we had oil that was derived from the blubber, which could be used for machinery and things like that, which very much helped into the industrial era. And then you, you had the spermaceti oil from the sperm whales, which would have been used in this, in the whale oil. And then the other thing that they had uh, was the whale bone, which would have been used extensively in, of course, corsets. 
for uh, you know as as time went on into the nineteenth into the nineteenth century. Okay, um, I'm watching my time. I think that might be about all I have time for. Um, so thank you very much for watching. This has been great and fun, and um, I turn it over to Jeremy. I think. Yes. Thank you both, that was fantastic. We have a great collection of questions that I'd like to ask both of you. So Jared and Joe, if you could both activate your cameras and your mics so we can hear you, I'm gonna ask a few questions here. Um, the first one is directed towards, probably towards Joe. Um, Joe, the question is, how involved was Gary Melchers in the affairs of Fredericksburg? Did he stay on top of issues in the community? Did he ever appear at local events to talk about his art? What can you say about that? Can you hear me, Jeremy? I can hear you, but I can't see you. Can you turn? Yeah, your... it says the host has stopped my video. Oh I boy, can... let's see if I can fix that for you. How about now? Can you do it yet? There we go. I got gotcha. you. Okay, I've lost you, but uh, oh, are you am, are you still there? We are. Yeah. Go. Okay. Yes. I'll read. I'll read the question again if you like. Oh, I'm I'm fine. Okay. I I really don't know if Gary was very involved in town. Um, I, his neighbors certainly knew who he was. Um, and I think over time he became better known because he wandered the streets of Falmouth and Fredericksburg to paint. He was inspired by small town life. And um, so he was, he was known and friendly, although very reserved. It was his wife really that established a lot of the connections for him. She was involved in saving Kenmore and Stratford and because of her involvement in town, uh, Gary became unwittingly the host for a lot of important events like when uh, Prime Minister David Lloyd George visited in 22 and Calvin Coolidge, uh, they hosted uh, receptions for them at Belmont. Mrs. Melchers was far more involved civically, particularly with the Stafford County Health Association over the years. Gary was very involved with artist circles in Richmond. He was a founder of the Virginia Museum and was on the uh, board of trustees of the Corcoran, but otherwise most of his activities uh, were centered in uh, his commercial headquarters in Manhattan. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. this, this is for both of you and we'll start with Jared. For both presenters, what's your dream acquisition for your respective collections? Jared, what's yours? Mm. Um, honestly, I would like to see smoking gun letters that said something along the lines of, you know, I wore this particular sword with this particular suit or, you know, something along those lines would actually, you know, because we know that he owned them. We know that it was the right time period, but, you know, we don't know for sure that James Monroe would have worn this particular sword with this particular suit, you know, things like that. But if we had a smoking gun letter that actually says, you know, that, that's what, you know, hey, I have a cut steel uh, small sword that I wore with, you know, that would be ideal, something that really connected. Because, um, you know, we, there's a lot of things that we have here that we know are the right time period, we know, that, you know, and, and they, we know for sure that they belong in Monroe, um, but we don't have, you know, know for sure, like if they actually were used in the White House or, you know, if just because something was made around, you know, 1820 and uh, was owned by Monroe, it's likely they would have been in the White House, but it wasn't exactly in the White House. If we had a letter that said for sure, and, we, and don't get me wrong, we have plenty of artifacts that we know for sure we use in the White House, but you know, things like that. So I think that would be, that would be a dream for me. Cool. Jared, while we have you, the next one is, is for you. Can you talk about the dress behind you? Oh yes. Okay, so this is Elizabeth Monroe's court gown. Um, it's a Regency period or empire period, whichever one you, you prefer. Um, you know, it's very much reflective of the time. In fact, there's a very uh, famous dress by Dolly Madison um, that uh, is a red dress that you see all over the place that it very much looks like this. For Jane Austen fans, there you go. That's about as Jane Austen as you get, right? Um, it's silk uh, velvet, okay? 
Um, and it's really cool. It's something that's really cool about silk velvet is, uh, do, do you know how you make velvet, by the way? Let me show you something, just real quick, hopefully, if you'll indulge me. <laughs> Let me show you something. All right. And then, look at, okay, look at this, look at this picture. Okay, you actually have two, you have, you have this machine, you have two weaves. Okay, can you see that? And then here, I'll get out of here. So you have two, you have two weaves of the fabric and then you have a machine that cuts down the middle and the velvet, that sort of cool velvet feel is the phrase that come from the inside of that. That's what that is. So you can imagine it would be quite laborious to make something like that. Um, something that's also interesting about this is that there's a possibility that she would have worn this in tandem with a, a gold netting and in fact, there's a gold netting, that's a whole other story, um, that, that exists that we'd love to get our hands on. Uh, but um, that it would be possible the gold netting. Now, you're seeing this in fluorescent lights, okay? Imagine it in candlelight or whale oil light, okay? And imagine like a gold netting around it and the, the glittering that would have come off. It would have been quite striking. It would have been quite beautiful. So, yeah, it's kind of a cool, cool object there. Very cool. Very cool. The next one is, is probably the most unique Mary Talks question I've seen yet, and I'm intrigued to hear what you have to say. Um, this person asked for a social studies assignment. My son had to interpret some modern artifacts completely wrong. He made a presentation saying Mario of Nintendo was a god of the Nintendo pantheon as evidenced by his image in books, games, and clothing. Can you share a story about an artifact maybe in your areas that was interpreted exactly incorrectly, either by you, hopefully not, or someone else in the field? Whoever wants to tackle that one, go for it. Well, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I will say that um, Melcher's traveled a great deal uh, for pleasure, but he always took his paint box with him. And he had a very good friend, uh, um, Charles McDonald, who was a, a golf course champion and, and golf course designer who had a home in Bermuda. So he often was going to the Caribbean for his vacations and um, would paint uh, the natives, the native inhabitants of the Caribbean islands. And so frequently collectors, dealers and researchers assume that if they have a picture of an African-American by Gary Melchers because he did paint African-Americans of our own community that they are American subjects when most of the time they're uh, natives of the Caribbean islands. Jared, do you have a, oh, Jared looks like he disappeared, like he might have- Yeah, I was trying to look for, it. there's an exactly <laughs> specific object. I, I don't know how time to grab it though. I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> there's several things though. Um, one, uh, there's actually, I'm looking at, I don't know if, well, it, I better not turn the camera, but there's actually a little buggy over here that was interpreted as as uh, um, Mariah's childhood buggy, a little little toy buggy. But it actually dates to the it's the style of the 1870s, which you know would have been quite a time leap. Uh, for <laughs> so um, yeah, um, we also have a harp over here that they said was a playable harp, um, but um, we actually have a harpist on staff who plays the harp and knows about these things. And she looked at us like, no, that's just a it's either a, a just a facsimile of one or a toy one, or they got ripped off. Um, so it wasn't a it wasn't exactly what they thought it was. So uh, yeah, there's certainly examples of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Joe, I'm so sorry. I cut you off and didn't let you answer what your dream acquisition was. What what do you what is your dream acquisition for your? Um, we you know we have the largest collection anywhere of Melcher's paintings, but we still have gaps. And so uh, from the period of his marriage in 1903, uh, well, I would say from 1900 until the time when he is working in Weimar, Germany. Uh, so the 10 years, 1900 to 1910, we, we are a little short on images from this period. And it's important to me because this is a period of transition for him. He, it, it, in an early part, very early, um, decade of his career, he was painting dark and homey middle or uh, working class in interiors and uh, everyday scenes of everyday life. But when he marries, suddenly he's much more interested in middle and upper class subjects, women, of course, in uh, their sphere of 
influence, particularly with children. And so he all of a sudden brightens up his colors and he loosens his brushwork in, in the idiom that he was seeing, observing in Paris with the Impressionists. So I wish I had more examples from that period. Interesting, okay. Uh, we're going to stick with another Belmont-related question. Uh, you had talked about how you you have the most Melcher's collections of anywhere. Um, where else can we can you find Melcher's works? Are they are they are they commonly spread around? Is there some institutions that seem to collect them, like you all do? A good question. Um, they are in the United States and Europe primarily. Um, the best collections I will I will mention. I think it's worth looking for Melcher's paintings in his hometown of Detroit, Michigan at the Detroit Institute of the Arts. And those are some of the finest works mm. by Gary Melcher's. Keep in mind that I, I have a huge collection, but a lot of these are preliminary studies and sketches or didn't sell. So that's why they're still here. So the best is still out in places like Detroit Chicago has a number. The uh, museum, uh, American Museum of Art, called the Smithsonian or SAM Museum in Washington, has a rather large collection. Uh, probably the seminal work comes to mind, um, the sermon, which is often on view. So those are the institutions that have the best selection. And then there are uh, iconic paintings in various museums in Europe, but I would say stateside, Detroit, Chicago, and Sam. Okay. I think we have more questions than we have time for. So at this point, um, I'm gonna have to thank all three of you, including Scott, for joining us this evening. Um, I'd also like to thank Mark Simpkins from Events AV who helped facilitate the virtual logistics of tonight's program. And thanks as always to our viewers at home for joining us and being a part of the conversation. Uh, remember that this presentation will be available for viewing on the UMW YouTube channel starting tomorrow. There you can watch this program and browse the full catalog of Mary Talks. Our fifth season of Mary Talks continues on Wednesday, April 28th with Dr. Christine Henry, assistant professor from the Department of Historic Preservation, who will present the history of roadside attractions. We look forward to seeing you then, if not earlier. Thank you all and good night. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.